Welcome to this recorded lecture, which is a continuation of uh, lecture, what's it, one, two, three, four, uh, backprop. As you all know, the, uh, the campus is shut today. We have no classes, so this is only a recorded lecture. There's nobody in the classroom. I'm nevertheless going to pretend there are people in the class, and we will continue with uh, where we left off. Now, in the last class, what we've seen so far was this that uh, neural networks are universal approximators. They can model any function at all, provided they're given the right architecture. But we must train them to approximate the function that we want, to, want, to, uh, want them to model. And what we mean by training them is that we must learn their weights and biases. And the way we do it is we train the network we, to, we learn the weights and biases to minimize the total error on our training set, and we need to do, do so through empirical risk minimization. We use variants of uh, gradient descent to do so, and the gradient of the error with respect to network parameters is computed through backpropagation. This is what we've seen so far. So here's a quick re a recap of the gradient descent algorithm. If you have some function fx, uh, which you want to minimize, what I mean by that is that you want to find the value of x at which f of x is minimum then you would start off with some initial estimate x0 of the location of the minimum. And then while the value of the function is continues to decrease, at each point we are going to subtract the sum step size times the derivative of the function at the current estimate to obtain the next estimate. And so what this would do is keep moving your current estimate down the function till you arrive at a minimum or a local minimum. So when you train neural networks with gradient descent, here's what it looks like. Uh, we have an error function, which is a function of all of the weights of the network. The error function is the average divergence on a training set. And you have all of these weights. So if you have a network with k layers, then you're going to have k sets of weights, one per layer. And so we would initialize all of these weights, and for each layer, we are going to compute the average derivative of the, uh, we're going to compute the average of the derivative of the divergences for the individual training instances with respect to all these parameters. And then we update the parameters by taking a step back against the derivative, against the gradient. And we do so until this error has converged. So we've seen this in the past classes. Question, question being, how do you compute this derivative? So how, how do you compute the derivative of the divergence for any single training instance with respect to any parameter? And we went through this in some detail in the last class. We went through the scalar case. I sort of rushed through the vector formulation where we pose the whole thing as vectors and matrices, and I don't think I did a very good job of explaining it, so we're going to go back and redo that a little bit in this class. So for layered networks, we saw it is generally simpler to think of the process in terms of vector operations. The arithmetic is simpler. And you can use fast matrix libraries to make the operations much faster. So now you can actually restate the entire process in vector terms. And in fact, this is what is actually used in any real system. You're not going to write scalar loops. You're going to perform vector operations because they're so much faster. So how exactly do you formulate the vectors? Now consider this. Let's say I have any one, I have some layer of neurons. Each of these circles represents a neuron. And, and uh, let's say the, this is the k minus 1th layer. So the output of the k minus 1th layer is going to be uh, some y k y1, k minus 1, through y, let's say, d k minus 1. So these are going to be the outputs of the k minus 1th layer. And then I have the subsequent layer of neurons, which would be the kth layer. Now consider what the affine combination coming in to the first neuron is going to be. That is going to be w11 of k times y1. So it's w11 of k times y1 of k minus 1 plus w21 
of k. So again, this is w21 because it's going, it's the connection from the second neuron to the first neuron. So this is plus w21 of k times y2 of k minus 1 and so on. So I can write this whole thing in vector form as w11 of k, w12 of k, and so on, times this vector, which is y1 of k minus 1, y2 of k minus, one, k minus 1, and so on. And this is just the affine combination that goes into the first neuron of the next layer. So I could write a similar set of equations for the second guy. And now that is going to be again for the second term. The, this is what you had for the first one term. For the second term, you would have W12 of k, W22 of k, and so on. And this vector would multiply this vector to give you the affine combination going into the second neuron. So this entire operation can now be written in matrix form, I can compose this matrix where each row of the matrix, what happened? I can compose this matrix where each row of the matrix is the set of weights going into one of these neurons. And so the first row is going to be the set of weights going into the first neuron. The second row is going to be the set of weights going into the second neuron and so on. So this matrix of weights represents all of the weights in these connections. And now the output of the k minus 1th layer can, can be written as a vector y k minus 1. And the affine combination going into the kth layer can be written as a vector z k. And now I can write the relation between the two if I also include a bias as saying uh, this is z1 of k through z whatever d of k is going to be the weights matrix of k times y1 of k minus 1 through y whatever d of k minus 1 plus the bias, and this is the bias going, the first entry is the bias going into the first neuron here, so that's going to be b1 of k all the way to BD of K. So this, you can see, is a nice uh, matrix or linear algebraic definition of the operations, the affine operations that, that result in the inputs to the kth layer. So once we've specified all of this, what happens? The output of the kth layer is simply going to be whatever activation you have in the kth layer applied to ZK, which is the affine combination going into the kth layer. And so we can write the entire operation of a specific layer of neurons as in, in terms of these two steps. First, zk is wk times yk minus 1 plus bk. Z, y, and b are vectors. W is a matrix of weights. And then finally, the output of the kth layer yk is, an, is the activation of the kth layer applied to zk. So once this is clarified, we can in fact write down the forward pass of how a network is evaluated in this manner. You can set y0, the, the uh, uh, first set of values going into the network to be equivalent, equal to the input to the network. The affine combination going into the first layer is going to be w1x or w1y0 in this case plus b1. And because the, the weights and the bias for the first layer are W1 and B1 respectively, then you would apply the, the activation of the first layer to get the output of the first layer, which is F1 times Z1. So this is the com complete com computation for the first layer. And then the affine combinations that go into the second layer are simply going to be W2 times Y1 plus B2. And the output of the second layer is going to be the activation of the second layer applied to Z2. And then the affine and this, 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 this computation can be continued till you eventually get the affine combination of inputs to the final layer. You apply a final activation and you get the output of the network. Now observe that all of this is just, if you think of it in terms of functions, this is just a, a nested operation. So the output of the network is 
this activation applied to Zn, where Zn is an affine combination of the outputs of the n minus 1 layer, so that's this guy, and the output of the n minus 1 layer is the activation of the n minus 1 layer applied to whatever went in. So if you root the whole thing down, it's going to be this function applied to this function, uh, to an, uh, applied to an affine combination of the outputs of this function, which is ap applied to an affine combination of the outputs of the previous function and so on. The entire neural network can be thought of as a large nested function with as many levels of nesting as you have layers in the network. And if you now compute the divergence for the, or between the output of the network and the target output, that is also going to be just some function applied to the output of the network itself. So here is the entire forward pass. You would initialize the network by setting y0 equals x, and you can scroll through the layers. It's very simple when you write it in vector form. Ck is wk times yk minus 1 plus bk, which is the affine combination going into the kth layer, and subsequently, the output of the kth layer is fk, which is the activation of the kth layer applied to zk. And the final output of the final layer is the output of the network itself. So here's the forward pass. I can write down the pseudocode for the forward pass in four, four sweet lines. Now, the backward pass, we've performed the forward pass, we've computed the, uh, not only the output of the network, but every intermediate value, uh, meaning every z and every y. And you, we can now use these to compute the gradients going backward. Now keep in mind that the divergence is being computed on the output of the network. So the divergence is a function of the output of the network, which in turn is a nested function. So the divergence that we are computing is also a nested function where the levels, you have as many levels of nesting within the divergence as the number of layers in the network. So now to compute the, perform the backward pass, it is now useful to look at some vector calculus. How do you compute, observe that all of these operations are vector operations, matrices multiplying vectors, and you have vector activations being apply, applied to vectors, producing vector outputs, everything is in terms of vectors and matrices. So in order to be able to compute the gradients going backwards, it's useful to look at some basics of of, uh, of vector calculus. So let's say I have a function y1 through ym of, which is y1 through ym which form a vector, and this is a function of z1 through zd which are also components of a vector. So you have a function y of a, 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 a vector function y of a vector input z then what is the derivative of this y with respect to this z? To do this, uh, to understand this, we have to go back to our uh, original definition. Remember how we defined uh, a, def a, a derivative. So if you had any y equals f of z, we said that the derivative is this term alpha that multiplies a small increment in z to give you the corresponding increment in y. So what this means is now delta y over here is going to be delta y1 through delta ym in the notation that we've got. And that's going to be this alpha. And delta z is going to be delta z1 through delta zd using our notation. So this alpha over here now if it must obviously be a matrix which transforms the d-dimensional increment by increment vector z to the m-dimensional increment vector y. And so this guy, alpha, is going to have this form. It's going to the uh, top row of alpha are simply the partial derivatives of the first component of y with respect to all of the components of z. And if you plug that in over here, you can see immediately, so let me just erase this alpha and write that down, you can see that this, if I write it like so, it's going to be dy1 by dz1 through dy1 through dzd. The second one is going to be par this is a partial derivatives, do y2 by dz1 all the way do y2 by do zd, and so on. If you work this out, you're going to see that delta y1 is going to be 
the partial derivative of y1 with respect to z1 times delta z1 plus the partial derivative of y2 with respect to z2 times delta z2 and so on, which really gives us back this equation for each of the components of y. So this equation is valid. This, this holds. You can see this. Now, having established this, so let me note all of these terms down just for reference because these are going to come back when we uh, actually. When, when we go through the backward pass. So delta z equals the Jacobian. So this derivative matrix of z with respect to, of y with respect to z, which I've written in this manner with the z within the parentheses, and we'll see why we've written it, written it in this manner in a little bit, is this matrix. This, this derivative matrix is what we will call a Jacobian. And so the, uh, <laughs> The equation we have is the delta y is going to be the derivative of y with respect to z, which is a Jacobian of y with respect to z times delta z. This is our first, uh, uh, first rule. We'll remember this. Now, let's go on and look at some, some of the properties of these derivatives. So if y is a scale, if the components of y are scalar functions of components of z, which means to say, which, which is to say that y1 is a function of only z1, but not z2 through z, z, zd, in that case, the partial derivative of y with respect to z1 is just going to be this full derivative, and y had, the derivative of y with respect to the remaining z's is just going to be zero. As a result, this Jacobian matrix is going to be a diagonal matrix. On the other hand, if, uh, uh, so where each of the diagonal entries is simply going to be the derivative of the uh, individual activations computed, oh, this should have been z1 and z2 and so on, computed around the, around the current values of z. So I have to fix this mistake. Now, if I have a vector activation where each y is a function of all of these z's, then the Jacobian matrix is no longer going to be a diagonal. The Jacobian matrix is going to be full, where every entry is going to be the partial derivative of the y with respect to the cor a corresponding z. Now, let's look at a special case of affine functions. So here, if I have the special case where I'm defining z equals w times y plus b. Now, I flipped the order here. Z is a function of y, but this is just an affine function. Z is a vector, y is a vector, w is a vector. Then what is the derivative of z with respect to y? <laughs> Look at this guy. <laughs> There's a ghost in the board. Now, uh, what is the derivative of z with respect to y? That Jacobian is simply going to be the weights matrix, w. And you can check this out, delta z is going to be w times delta y. By through simple inspection, you can see that this holds. So this is basically satisfying the same, uh, same relationship that we expect our derivatives to, to have, which basically tells us that the derivative, the Jacobian of z with respect to y is going to be w. So let me write this down. So if z equals wy plus b, then this implies that the derivative of z with respect to y, or I'll just write this as a Jacobian of z with respect to y is going to be w. And by the same token, the derivative of z with respect to b is going to be just 1 because z, b is an additive term. Now, here's another property. I have a chain rule for <laughs> Jacobians. Stop. <laughs>
okay. So, I have a chain rule for Jacobians which is let us say y is a nested function of f and g. So, y equals f of g of x. Then what is the derivative where y is a vector and x is a vector? Then what is the derivative of y with respect to x? I can write it in, write it in this manner. I can say z equals g of x. If z equals g of x, then the derivative of z with respect to x is simply going to be the Jacobian of, Jacobian of z with respect to x. Now I can write y equals f of z because z is g of x. So let us look at what happens over here. I can write I the derivative of y with respect to z is going to be the Jacobian of y with respect to z times and so delta y equals the Jacobian times delta of z. But then similarly the derivative of z with respect to uh, x is going to be the Jacobian of z with respect to x which means that you have delta z equals the Jacobian of z times delta of x. So if I plug this delta of z out into this equation over here, this is going to give you delta of y equals j y of z times j z of x delta of x. So if I look at the relationship of delta of y with respect to delta of x, the multiplicative term is this term in the box over here which is the product of two Jacobians and the important thing is to note the order in which the multiplication was done. So the derivative of the inner term comes outside, the derivative of the outer term comes inside. If you change the order the dimensions will not match. You may not even be able to multiply the matrices. So this, the, de the derivative of y with respect to x is going to be the derivative of y with respect to g, in this case I am representing that as z times the derivative of this guy with respect to x in that order. Now if y is a scalar, the same property still holds. Now if y is a scalar, uh, in this case instead of y I have a d, if, so I have a scalar function which is a nested function of x, so d is some function f of g of x. How does this hold? Now the derivative of d with respect to gx is simply the gradient of d with respect to x. We know from our previous uh, lectures that this guy is going to be, first actually let me write this other rule down. So we have if y equals f of g of x, this implies the derivative of y, I should write this as the Jacobian of y with respect to x is going to be the Jacobian of y with respect to g or z as you may call it times the derivative of uh, z with respect to x. So this is another rule. Instead of z I am writing g in this case. And if I have a divergence d which is a scalar which is a scalar function of a vector function of x, then what do you get? Firstly, we know that if I have d equals any function, any function of x, then the derivative of d with respect to x is a row vector. We have seen this before. So you expect this term, the derivative of d over here with respect to x to be a row vector. And now let us write this down. I can write z equals g of x and d equals f of z. So the derivative of d with respect to z is going to be a rho vector. The derivative of this is hilarious. The derivative of g with respect to x, the d with respect to z is a rho vector. The derivative of z with respect to x is a full Jacobian. So applying the same rule as before, you will find that the derivative of d with respect to x is the derivative of d with respect to z times the Jacobian of z with respect to x. Now this is a row vector, this is a matrix, the product of the two is going to give you a row vector, the dimensions hold. And they, we use this, we can use the same logic as before to actually give you this rule. 
which will tell you that the derivative of d, the divergence, divergence of d with respect to x equals the divergence of d with respect to g times the Jacobian of g with respect to x. So let's go oh wait. So we have those rules up there. I don't know if you will be able to see it. I'll try to keep that there. And now we'll use this board. OK, we are spending some time on these derivatives. They may, it may be a bit confusing, but please go back and look at the slides and try to understand these, because uh, we're going to be using these guys for our final backpropagation rule. Once you get these, once you figure out that these things hold, the backpropagation is trivial. So now let's go back and look at this other case. Again, the same thing, where I have the derivative, this function scalar value d is some function f of an affine combination of y. And then in this case, using the same rule that we had earlier, what happened? I need to tie this somewhere. These boards are useless. Okay, let me just hold this. <laughs> so uh, if you, just using the same rule that I had over here, g of x is now just an affine function. So the, this derivative, using this chain rule, you will find that the derivative of d with respect to y in this case is going to be the divergence of d with respect to z, which is this affine combination, times the derivative of z with respect to y. And we saw earlier that when you have something of this kind, when z equals w y plus b, then the derivative of z with respect to y is simply going to be the weights matrix. So the, just applying the two, to the, the two together, the derivative of d with respect to y is going to be the divergence of d with respect to this affine combination, which we've called z, times this weight matrix. That's something we want to remember. And then here are the final two rules. What is the derivative of this divergence with respect to y? And this is, is a slightly non-obvious. But then if I have a function, some, some function f, of w times y plus b. Now, this guy is a scalar. This is a matrix. So I can write z equals, just, just using the same rules as before, uh, I can write uh, z equals w y plus b, which is what we have, we've got over here. And now, what is the derivative of d with respect to z going to be? So the derivative of d with respect to z is a row matrix comprising the partial derivatives of z with, re with respect to the individual components of, of d with, the, with respect to the individual components of z. And by our notation, y is a column vector. And if you actually work this out, then, this will, the, then uh, what you will find is that the derivative of d with respect to w is simply going to be what you have over here, which is y times the derivative of d with respect to z. Now, why is this of relevance? This is of particular relevance to us because let's say I have a layer of neurons. And this layer of neurons is feeding into the next layer of neurons. So at this point, you have a z. Here, you have a y. And then you have more activations. And then all of this goes on to eventually compute a divergence. The divergence is a scalar. And in between these two, you have the weights matrix W. So what you really have is that z, the divergence, is some function of W times y plus the bias because this guy is the z, right? And so when I try to write the derivative of this divergence with respect to this weight, what you will find is the derivative of the divergence with respect to the weight is going to be, the, is going to be this y, 
times the derivative of the divergence with respect to the z. So this relationship for the network, if, if I have a network of this kind, then you're going to find this relationship. And we're going to use this again, right? So we were, and so also I can show, show that the derivative of the, of d with respect to this b is simply going to be the derivative of d with respect to z itself. So in this case, the derivative of this divergence with respect to any bias that you might have at this, at this layer is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z. You can work this out, but let's take my word for it now, for now. And now, having gone through this tedious arithmetic, we are all set for the backward pass, which is really very trivial. So uh, let me try to write that over here, which is, uh, I, I can use this board. So we're going to actually work our way backwards. We have the divergence out at, at the end. At the very first step, I'm going to compute the divergence with respect to the output of the network. So let me call this the di di divergence, the, deriv well, the derivative of the divergence with respect to y is also called a divergence, unfortunately. So I have this, it's a gradient, sorry. So I have the gradient of the divergence with respect to y. So at the very first step, I'm going to compute the gradient of the divergence with respect to y. Next step, I'm going to compute from the gradient of the, I'm going to compute the gradient of the divergence with respect to z. But then using our chain rule, right? We know that y is simply a function of z. So that, that's where this chain rule applies. And so the derivative, the next derivative, I'm just going to write multiply the Jacobian of y with respect to z. This is y n with respect to z n. I'm just using the chain rule going backwards. And now having done this, so this is, I'm just, I'm just going to multiply, right multiply the divergence of, well, the, the gradient of the divergence with respect to y with respect to the, with the, by the derivative of y with respect to z, which is simply the Jacobian, as we've seen earlier. And now, if I take another step back and I compute the derivative, I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this y, all I have to do over here is right multiply the derivative of the, of z with respect to y, which is simply going to be w as we saw. And so the next step when I take a step back is I'm going to multiply the derivative of the divergence with the gradient of the divergence with respect to z with by the derivative of z with respect to y, which is simply the weights matrix. Now here I take a step sideways and I also compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this weight. But over there now I can use this rule over here. The derivative of this divergence with respect to the weights in this matrix is simply going to be the output of this layer, y, times the derivative of the divergence with respect, the gradient of the divergence with respect to the z's. So that's what you will get. The derivative of the divergence with respect to the weights matrix over here is going to be the output of this layer times the gradient of the divergence with respect to the z. And so also I can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the biases here, which is simply going to be the gradient of the divergence with respect to z. So we're all set. Now having done this, at this point I already have the derivatives of the divergence with respect to all of these y values. I can take a step back, and now I can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to these z values. And that is simply going to right multiply the Jacobian of y, n minus 1 with respect to z n, uh, respect to z computed at z n minus 1. So you can see why I put a z in the argument. It, uh, I'm, able to ident I'm able to specify at which lo lo location the Jacobian is being computed. And so that's going to be, and for scalar activations, this Jacobian is going to be just a 
diagonal matrix. Now having done that, now I can take a step back and compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to these y's. And that's simply going to right multiply the derivative of this z with respect to this y, which is simply going to be the weights matrix, Wn minus 1. Having done that, I can now take a step sideways and compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to these weights, these weights, which is going to be this y times the, de gra the gradient of the divergence with respect to this z, that's this term here, and the derivative of the divergence with respect to the biases here is simply going to be the gradient of the divergence with respect to this z. And now I can move back. I can, I can keep repeating the process, moving backwards, until I compute the gradient of the divergence with respect to the z's over here. And then from those, I can compute the derivatives with respect to the weights and biases. And in some problems, we'll see this later, you may even want to compute the derivative with respect to the input. But what we've seen is that at each step, when you're going backwards, all that happened is that at each step, you took the current derivative and you right multiplied it by either a Jacobian or a weight. So each step going backward was just a single multiply. And so the backward pass is a very simple operation. So if I were to write the entire thing down like so, then here's what it's going to look like. I'm going to, once I've done the forward pass, I would first compute the gradient of the divergence with respect to the output of the network. Then going back, I would first compute the Jacobian of the activations, post-multiply the Jacobians. That will give me the, the gradient of the divergence with respect to the Zs. Then take a step back and post-multiply this derivative by the weights matrix. That's going to give me the, the gradient of the divergence with respect to the previous y's and keep going backward at each step from this guy, I compute this guy by post multiplying by Jacobian. From this guy, I compute this guy by post multiplying by a weight. I can take, I can roll my way backwards. Along the way, at each step, I can also compute the, grade, the derivative of the divergence with respect to each weights matrix, which is going to be the product of the y before the weights matrix and the derivative of the z with respect to the z value after the weights matrix, and also the derivative of the divergence with respect to the biases, which is going to be simply the gradient of the divergence with respect to the z's. So you can compute this little operation over here as the entire backward pass, and this is how you would compute the derivative of the divergences with respect to all the parameters of the network for a single input. And you can actually note that this is very analogous to the forward pass. In the forward pass at each step, first we computed an affine combination of the outputs of the previous layer and then applied an activation to it. Over here, again, we are, we are computing an affine combination of the derivatives uh, with, the, with respect to the next variable and subsequently post-multiplying it by Jacobian. So the two are actually very anal analogous. Here is the entire process written out in a little more detail. I'll skip the slide. So here's how we'd set up for a simple digit recognition problem. If you have a simple problem like recognizing whether an image is two or not two, you'd have a network with a single sigmoid activation where, so the output is going to lie in between zero and one and the desired output is either zero or one. You'd use the KL divergence or the cross entropy. You'd learn back propagation to this entire algorithm is called back propagation. You'd use back propagation to compute the derivatives with respect to the individual uh, inputs, and if you'll actually go over here, this little thing that I just skipped, now, now I let me go back and revisit it, here's the overall operation. You'd initialize all your weights and biases, then you go through all of your inputs, and having gone through all of your inputs, for each input you're going to compute these derivatives with respect to the, of the divergence with respect to the weight and the bias, and then you're going to aggregate these, these derivatives to compute the derivative of the total error over the entire training, input, uh, training set with respect to these parameters. And once you've gone through the entire input, you can go back and now you actually have the uh, derivative of the total error over the training data with respect to the parameter. You can plug that into your gradient descent rule and update your parameters. So uh, now same thing over here, instead of just trying to recognize whether it's a two or not, if you had a multi-class problem, the problem remains the same. 
The only thing is that now the output is going to, layer is going to have 10 outputs, or maybe 11 outputs if you want to include the class, not a digit. And uh, that would be computed using a softmax layer, and then you can use backpropagation to compute all of the derivatives and go back, plug those derivatives into this little, uh, the, into this little uh, algorithm and update all your parameters. So uh, I, uh, I'm hoping that you somehow stayed with, uh, through with this somewhat tedious sounding uh, description of the process. Please go back and look at the slides and understand what's going on. The whole process is really very, very, very simple. So basically it just comprises this continuous right multiplication of one term at a time. And uh, to compute the derivative for a single input, you'd aggregate these over your entire training set and then perform your gradient descent updates. The issues here is how well does this gradient descent process actually learn the parameters and how can we improve it? And you're of course learning network parameters for just your training set. If you want to go beyond your training set, you need this to be to generalize. So how well will it generalize? And then what does that really mean? There are all various questions. We're going to answer these, not just in this lecture, but over the next few lectures. But for now, let's move on. Let's look at this business of, does this actually even converge? So first, does backpropagation always work? Does this gradient descent algorithm that we saw, which we're just going to call backprop, give you the correct solution? And then how does it converge? And what are the restrictions? And what alternate approaches do we have? Can we modify the approach to be incremental? And how do you speed up the whole algorithm to get you the answer faster? That's what we're going to look at in the next couple of lectures. So first, is backpropagation always going to give you the correct answer? As, assuming it actually finds the global or local minimum of the divergence function. So in classification problem, if you're computing the classification error, this is just a count of how many times the classifier has been wrong. Counting is not a differentiable operation. So the divergence function that we use, like the cross entropy, is actually only a proxy for this classification error. And so this gives you this peculiar situation where when you minimize this proxy, you may not actually be minimizing the actual error that you want to minimize. You're minimizing the divergence. This may not minimize the classification error. Let's look at a simple example. This is a very nice paper by Brady, Raghavan, and Sloney in 89. Uh, so let's say you have this example data. You have all of these red dots which represent class one and these blue dots which represent class zero. Now they're all linearly separable. So if I were to use the perceptron algorithm, just a single perceptron, we're not going to work with the entire networks. For this, for this little explanation, I'm just going to use a single perceptron. If I use a perceptron algorithm, we know that when the classes are linearly separable, the perceptron is going to capture the boundary, the decision boundary immediately. So the perceptron algorithm would find this boundary. Now, if I were to, instead of using the perceptron algorithm, if I were to replace the threshold function over here by a sigmoid and then use backprop, then two, this perceptron, where now the perceptron is now no longer going to give you a binary zero, one output, it's going to give you a number between zero and one. And if you apply the threshold of 0.5, say, to decide whether the output is going to be assigned a class of one or a class of zero, then you would find that that, that modified perceptron, the logistic function two, would give you the perfect decision boundary. It would exactly separate out the red and the blue classes. But now I add a spoiler. I put a little red dot over here. What happens? The, the classes are still linearly separable. The perceptron algorithm will separate the classes. But now, if I use the same data and try to perform backprop, the only condition under which backprop will fa always find the solution, regardless of where the spoiler is placed, is if there is no bound on how large the weights can be. So for example, if this guy were arbitrarily close to the blue, you would expect to find a very sharp threshold uh, function. And that means that the weights must begin approaching infinity. So 
Uh, if I place any kind of a bound on how large the weights can be, then the backdrop algorithm is not going to find the solution. It's going to find some other decision boundary of this kind, which actually misclassifies this one red dot. Now, the reason for this, intuitive reason for this, is that if you look at the overall loss function, the empirical loss function, the empirical loss function is going to be dominated by these guys. This is one little addition to the overall loss. It's not going to affect the overall loss very much. And so by including this one little guy, the solution is not going to change that much from where what you got using the original set of uh, training instances. And uh, keep in mind that these could be one million each of all of these instances, and this is just one little guy. So this guy is not going to affect the overall, uh, overall loss function very greatly. So the moment you actually put any kind of restriction on what the length of the weight vector is, the uh, values of the weights. So for example, if I, if I place a restriction that the length of the weight vector is one, then backpropagation is not going to find you a boundary that actually labels this red dot as a blue dot. On the other hand, regardless of the restriction on the weights, the perceptron algorithm can actually find you this boundary. Uh, so what happens? As I keep moving this spoiler around, in each case, the perceptron algorithm is actually going to find you the boundary. Whereas backprop is only going to give you a boundary that wiggles around a little bit. And unless the red dot happens to be in a proper region of the space, it's not actually going to classify the red dot just right. So what is happening over here? The perceptron algorithm may change greatly upon adding just a single new training instance. It fits the training data very well. So it always finds the solution. In other words, the perceptron algorithm has a low bias. But a high variance, just moving one point, can completely change the solution. On the other hand, backprop, as we post it, with any kind of restriction on the weights, is not going to get tremendously affected by just adding one new, not so good looking training instance. So in other words, it prefers consistency over perfection. It's a low variance estimate, where it reduces the variance at a potential cost to bias. Now, is this a feature or a bug? we would claim it's a feature that it actually is not going to be uh, hypersensitive to small uh, to noise in your training data. So this is not restricted to just to single perceptrons. In an MLP, the lower layers, as we will see, learn a representation that enables linear separation by higher layers. So what this means is that when I have training data of this kind, by this, you can think of the network as this initial portion, which sort of rearranges this training data so that they are linearly separable. And now this final perceptron, final neuron, which actually finds a linear boundary between the two. So if you go back and look at the original dots, if I have data arranged in this manner, this MLP would find a decision boundary of this kind. But now suppose I add one little dot on the other side like so. You can have any number of these properly arranged dots. So this one little guy is just one tiny spoiler. It's not going to completely modify the manner in which the network, is network learns. So this decision boundary is not going to swing a whole lot in order to account for this new training instance. It's only going to change a little bit. So uh, in general, uh, spoilers do not have the ability to modify what is learned by the network too much. So the network tends to be somewhat, this learning algorithm tends to be somewhat robust too to to outliers, which is a good thing. So what this means is that backpropagation will often not find a separating solution, even though the solution is within the class of functions learnable by the network. And this is because the separating solution is not a feasible optimum for the loss function. One resulting benefit is that a backprop trained neural network, a neural network classifier has lower variance than an optimal classifier for the training data. An optimal classifier is one that does a perfect job for classification, but that's going to change a whole lot if just one point moves around, whereas a backprop trained classifier is not going to just swing around with, with, with outliers. Here's a second issue. We are defining a divergence function, and we are trying to find the parameters that minimize this divergence function. So in 
all of the examples and statements that we've seen so far, we've assumed that the loss objective has a single global optimum that could be found. And even when we say said something about the variance, we're assuming that there's a single global optimum. What about local optima? So if I have a divergence function whose shape actually looks like this, then you find several local optima where you have little valleys. And depending on where the algorithm starts, it's going to end up at the closest local valley. So what does this error function actually look like? It turns out that in large networks, uh, nobody really understands what this error function looks like. There are several hypotheses. Uh, so one hypothesis, one popular hypothesis is, is that you have many more saddle points of this kind. All of these are different instances of saddle points. Then you have local minima. That all of these local minima are somehow equivalent and close to a global maximum minimum. And this is only, hold, only holds for large networks. It doesn't necessarily hold for small networks. Now, what do I mean by a saddle point? A saddle point is a point like this, where locally the derivative is zero, but if you go walk along some directions, the, net, the, the, the function value goes up. In other directions, the function value goes down. So if you think of the Hessian of this function at this point, some of these eigenvalues are positive, which means they represent directions where the function is a minimum, and some of the eigenvalues are going to, uh, uh, where the function is a maximum, and some of the eigenvalues are going to be negative, representing directions where the function is a minimum. So, oh, is that right? I may have got this flipped. But in any case, gradient descent algorithms often tend to get stuck in these saddle points. Now, there's been a great deal of work on trying to understand this uh, error surface. And here are several uh, different papers. Bald, Baldi and Hornick in 89 uh, claimed that uh, uh, an MLP with a single hidden layer has only saddle points and no local minima. Uh, Dauphin et al., 2015, say there are an exponential number of saddle points in large networks. Uh, Komoransky et al., also 2015, say that for large networks, most local minima lie in a small band, and they're all equivalent. And Schwartz et al., in 2016, claim that uh, uh, in networks of finite size trained on finite data, you can have terrible local minima. So, all of these things, they're not necessarily contradicting each other, but they all seem to be saying different things. And I expect that we'll be seeing more results of this kind in the future. So here's the story so far. Neural networks can be trained via gradient descent that minimizes a loss function. Backpropagation can be used to derive the derivatives of the loss. Backprop is not guaranteed to find a true solution even if it exists and lies within the capacity of the network to model. So the optimum for the loss function may not be the true solution. And for large networks, the loss function may have a large number of unpleasant saddle points, which backpropagation could find and get stuck in. So in the, that's all very fine. That's assuming the algorithm actually finds a local minimum. So in the discussion so far, we've assumed that the training actually arrives at a local minimum. Does it always converge? Does it always arrive at a local minimum? And if it does, how long does it take to get there? So this is kind of hard to analyze. It's very important to know because that determines how much time and how much effort you're going to spend training your model. And on the other hand, it's really hard to analyze for multi-layer perceptrons because they're very complex. So what we will do is go back and look at a much simpler problem that we can understand and try to extrapolate what we know to the more complex situation of multi-layer perceptrons. And specifically, we're going to look at convex functions simply because convex functions are easy to interpret. We're going to use the streetlight effect where we look for whatever we are looking for by search, whatever we are searching for by looking where it's easiest. So what do I mean by a convex function? A convex function is a function of this kind where if I draw a line between any two points on the function, every point on the line is going to remain above the curve. So this, is a, this, this, is a, this curve represents a convex function. If I took it, take any two points on it and connect them up, you note that the entire line lies above the curve. Same thing over here. I can also define a convex set. A convex set is a set where I can take any two points within the set. If I connect them up, every point on the line that connects the two is going to lie within the set. So this is, these, are, these are convex sets. 
Now, this is a non-convex function. The function is, still has a unique global minimum. It doesn't even have saddle points. But on the other hand, if I, if I connected these two points over here, or this point and this point, you're going to see that that point actually goes both above the curve and below the curve. It doesn't stay always above the curve. So this is non-convex. So also this is a non-convex set. If I connect these two points, some of the points on the line are outside the, uh, the set. We're going to be talking mostly about these guys. Now, what does it mean for, create, for the iterative algorithm, for an iterative algorithm like gradient descent to converge? So let's say these figures represent contour plots of, of, of your loss function. What do I mean by a contour plot? Every line over here, every curve over here, represents an, the locus where the, 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 the function takes a specific value. So for every point on this line, the function value is the same on this curve, for instance. And the color shows you the value of the function. So the lowest value is right within the, within the darkest region. So your estimate, your iterative estimate, is said to converge if the estimates sort of go somewhat cleanly and end up at the local, at the, at the minimum. On the other hand, if your, your, if your iterations result in solutions which sort of bounce around like this, thus the algorithm is not actually finding the minimum, instead it's jittering. We can also have behavior like this, where your estimates begin to swing around wildly and eventually go, eventually go away from the minimum. In this case, the estimate is said to diverge. So how fast, if the, network, if the estimate is converging, how fast is it actually converging? There are different ways of quantifying it. This is a very nice way of doing it. So let's say x star is the optimum value that you want to find. Then you can look at the difference between the value of the function of the current estimate and the value of the function at the optimum. And the ratio of this distance at the x plus 1th estimate and the distance at the xth estimate, that tells you how fast the function is converging. If this ratio is always less than 1, then it tells you that at each step you're getting closer and closer to the optimum. If this ratio is greater than 1, it tells you that your estimates are actually taking you away from the optimum. And if the ratio equals 1, it tells you that you're just wandering around at effectively the same level without actually getting to the optimum. So if I can place an upper bound on R, which is less than one, then the convergence is said to be linear. In reality, what, is hap what it means is that in K steps, you're going to be C raised to K times closer to the optimum than at the beginning of these K steps. So you're actually arriving at the solution exponentially fast, although we will call the convergence linear because you think of this in terms of uh, the logs of how fast you arrive. So now let's consider a very single simple function. Let's consider a quadratic function. A quadratic, quadratic function has this nice property that if A is, uh, if, you are, uh, if A is positive, then uh, this, the quadratic function has uh, this, uh, let's think of a function of a single variable. The quadratic function will have this, this form, half aw squared plus bw plus c. I've used this as extra half for convenience. And this is going to be a convex function with a global minimum. Now, this is the gradient. If you were to use an iterative solution, then you would start off at some estimate, and then you'd use this simple gradient descent rule to try to find the estimate. And let's assume that we're actually using gradient descent. then what happens is <laughs> you have a function of this kind. You have, an, this is x, this is f of x. You might have some current estimate, xk. And at this point, the gradient is negative. So you're going to increase x. So you're going to take a step in this direction which is to say you're going to walk forward by some amount. Now, clearly there's a unique, uh, so uh, there's a unique minimum over here. 
So let's say at this point, the derivative you have xk, and the derivative is whatever f prime of xk. So I want to take a step along f prime of xk to give xk plus 1. What must the step size be for me to arrive at this optimum fastest? What is the fastest I can actually arrive at the optimum? The fastest I can arrive at this optimum is to take just a single step, right? So I just want to go directly there in one step. In that case, what is this value eta? What is the value eta that will ensure that I go from here to here in just one single step? Let's look at this. So let's say I am at some current value wk. I can rewrite this function using Taylor, or Taylor series expansions in this form, which is the value of the function of the current estimate plus the derivative of the current at the current estimate times w minus wk plus half times the double derivative of the current estimate plus w minus wk whole squared. These two functions are identical. Regardless of what the value of wk is, these two are going to be the same, right? And now let's use this Taylor expansion and see where the minimum actually lies. So observe, remember that the update rule we are going to use is wk plus 1 equals wk minus eta times f prime of wk, right? Now let's take the function up here and I know the function is convex, so if I just take a, take a derivative and set it to zero, I should find the location of the minimum. So let's take the derivative with respect to w. If I take the respect, der, derivative with respect to w, I'm going to find uh, the derivative of, I should call this e prime, let's say, because I'm calling it e, right? So the derivative of e with respect to w is going to be e prime wk from the first term plus 2 times half of e w prime double prime of wk times w minus wk i just did this by taking the derivative of this taylor series expansion which is the same as the function itself if I, so I can, of course, cancel this out. 2 times half is just 1. If I set this to 0, then I can pre-multiply by E double prime of Wk inverse times E prime of Wk equals minus of W minus Wk. And if you work this out, that's going to give you the w, where the function is minimum, as wk minus e do, the do, double derivative of uh, e with respect to wk, the inverse of the double derivative of e, e with respect to wk times the derivative. Now, if I compare the two, this gives me the solution immediately, which means that if eta equals this term, I'm going to have this behavior where from the current estimate I get to the global optimum in a single step. And so the optimum step size is going to be the inverse of the second derivative of my function computed at the current location. But since E is a quadratic, the second derivative of E is simply A. So the optimum step size is simply going to be A inverse, right? Now what happens if I take a step size that's less than the optimum step size. If I take a step size that's less than the optimum step size, instead of going directly all the way here, I'm going to go end up shorter. So I'm going to end up taking multiple steps. But I'm going to continue to walk in the same direction. What if I take a step size that's larger than the optimal step size? If I take a step size that's larger than the optimal step size, I'm going to overshoot. At each point, I'm taking a step size that's longer, larger than the optimal step size. So now I'm going to go back in the other direction and come here and then go back 
and slowly find my way to the optimum. But then, how large can the step size be? When the step size is twice the optimal step size, I'm going to end up over here. At that point, if I come back, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to keep oscillating back and forth. I'll never get to the optimum. And if the step size I take is more than twice the optimal step size, I actually end up walking up. And now, my estimates are going to diverge. So this is the behavior that we have with respect to the optimal step size for a quadratic. So for generic differential fun differentiable functions, functions which are not quadratic, if they are convex, they can, then I can always use a Taylor series approximation to approximate them by a quadratic function, in which case this a term that we had, that's simply going to be the second derivative with respect to the current estimate, right? And so in this case, the optimal step size is going to be the inverse of the second derivative of the function computed, computed at the current location. And if your step size is more than two times this optimal step size, the, the, your iterations can diverge. Now this is all very easy. Now it gets really complicated when you have functions of multiple variables. For example, when we are trying to estimate weights. So our weights are not just one value. We have millions of weights in your network. So basically you have multivariate input your loss is a scalar. So you have a scalar function of multivariate inputs. Now consider a simple quadratic function of multivariate inputs. If it's a quadratic function of multivariate inputs, you can actually write it in this manner, where it's half of w, w is simply a vector composed of all of your, of all of your inputs. As you can write this as half of w transpose aw plus w transpose b plus c, where c is some constant. And if A happens to be a full matrix, it means that the, the, you have couple terms where, of the kind W1, W2. But if A is a diagonal matrix, then this guy is going to look like where is my chalk? So if A is a diagonal matrix, then this guy is looking, going to look like this, W1 through Wn. This is A11 through A n hand, the rest are 0, times W1 through Wn. And because all of these off diagonal terms are 0, this is simply going to be summation Aii Wi squared. So this means that when A is a diagonal matrix, I can simply write this function as the sum of many independent quadratics, where the Wi's are uncoupled. It's a sum of n independent quadratic functions. What does such a function look like? It's going to, if I took the, if I plotted the contour plot for such a function, you're going, it's going to look like this, a bunch of ellipses, where each ellipse is an equal value contour, and all of the contours are going to be parallel to the axis. So for example, if I took several vertical slices, all of these vertical slices are going to have the same shape, but just, uh, just uh, uh, at different heights. So the reason, you get the, you, the reason you get this behavior is that basically you have E equals uh, the, uh, in this case, if I have only two dimensions, I have uh, A11 w1 squared plus something plus half a22 w2 squared plus the linear terms. So this guy in this plot is going to have uh, this term is going to look something like this. This term in a different plot, this is against w1, this is against w2, this two is going to look like a quadratic. You're summing these two across W1 and W2. So similarly, so here if I took several uh, horizontal slices, all of these horizontal slices are going to look like paraboloids. And, uh, and uh, they're going to have it, they, they're going to be at different heights. So now, here is the function of E, e plotted as a function of W1. And uh, 
the different slices are all going to have different heights, but they will all have their minimum at the same point. And all of them are going to have this shape is going to be half of A11W1 squared plus B1W1 plus some constants. And the constant depends on W1, which, which, which determines the height. So also, if I look at it as a function of W2, this is going to be half of A22, W2 squared plus additional terms plus a constant which depends on W1, which determines the height. So here this notation, this, this bar shows, says all terms that don't depend on W1. So if you look at this quadratic and look at what we, remember what we saw earlier, if from any current estimate, if I want to get to the optimum in a single step, then the optimum step size is going to be A11 inverse. Here, the optimum step size is going to be A22 inverse. But then if I think of W1 and W2 as a single vector, and then I think of the vector update rule, the vector update rule that we have is of this kind. The vector update rule is going to be WK, K plus one equals WK minus eta times the gradient of the error with respect to W, computed at WK, right? So this means every component of W uses the same step size. So if you were to use the optimal step size, if you were using the optimal step size for dimension one, which is A11 inverse, it's not going to be the optimal size step size for dimension two, and vice versa. So what happens? Uh, so when you have something of this kind, you're going to be just walking against the gradient, which means that you have the same step size for every single component. So what happens? You want some, something peculiar happens over here. So let me go back over to, the, to this one. So let's say A11 inverse is more than two times A22 inverse. What happens? For the first component W1, I will find the optimal value of W1 in a single step. But W22, this for, W2, for W2, the step size is too large, the estimate is going to diverge. Similarly, if I take the optimal step size for this guy, I may find that the behavior, that, that behavior is not optimal for the first component, and so the estimate may diverge or be too slow or a variety of other things can happen. So, uh, so let's look at this figure over here. So here I have two dimensions. The optimal step size for one, the first dimension is one. The optimal step size for the second dimension is 0.33. I've used a global step size, which is 2.1 times the optimal step size for dimension two, which is going to be 0.7 approximately and 0.7 is less than the optimal step size for the first dimension. So you will find that along the first dimension, that is along the vertical axis, the estimate slowly converges and eventually arrives at the correct location. Along the second dimension, this step size is more than twice the optimal step size. So the estimate is now going to begin swinging around and it's going to blow up. So although it converged in the vertical direction, it, it diverged in the horizontal direction. In the second estimate, the step size I'm going to take is exactly twice the optimal step size for the horizontal direction. This is still less than the optimal step size for the first direction. So you will find that the estimate is going to converge slowly along the first direction, along the vertical direction, but in the horizontal direction, it never converges or diverges. It just bounces around. Here, I have 1.5 times this guy, that's the step size. So now this step size is small enough to permit convergence in both directions. So it's going to converge, it's going to converge uniformly in the first direction. In the second direction, because it's still greater than one times 0.33, although it's less than two times 0.33, it's going to sort of oscillate, but still going to find the, the optimal value. And in this example, the step size is exactly the optimal step size for the second direction. So what you observe is that in the horizontal direction, in a single step, it's, found, it's come to the optimal point. But this is too small, much smaller than this guy. So in the vertical direction, it's going to, it's going to converge to the solution slowly. 
So overall, what you will find is that for the whole thing, the algorithm to converge, the step size that you take must be smaller than two times the smallest of the optimal step sizes for all the directions. If it isn't, then your, oh, then your estimate is going to behave in one of these, these ways, and the estimate is going to diverge. So more of the same. And so overall, convergence behaviors become increasingly unpredictable as dimensions increase. For the fastest convergence, ideally, the learning rate must be close to both the largest optimal step size and the smallest optimal step size so that, they, so that the iterations converge along all directions quickly. But this is generally not going to be infeasible. And so convergence is going to be really slow if you try to enforce convergence and keep it from diverging if the ratio of the largest optimal step size to the smallest optimal step size is very large because you're going to try to keep it to below the smallest optimal step size to keep it from diverging. So you want this condition number to be close to one, otherwise convergence is going to be slow. You have more problems. For quadratic strongly convex functions, the gradient descent tends to be exponentially fast. For more generic Lifshitz smooth convex fun functions, which are, less, which are less convex than quadratics, which means you can place a quadratic bowl within these functions, then the convergence is actually going to be much slower instead of instead of converging at the rate of c raised to k, it's going to converge at the rate of 1 over k. And this is actually going to be inversely proportional to the learning rate. So this means that if your objective function is not sufficiently convex, it's going to converge very slowly. And so if you choose an inappropriate learning rate, which is too high, this is actually going to become a small value and it's not going to converge very fast. If it's too small, it's not going to converge either an inappropriate learning rate can destroy your happiness. So part of this reason is that when you have functions of this kind, the eccentricity of the function in different directions is going to be different. And this is going to be even more difficult when the ellipses are not axis aligned because the steps along the two directions are now coupled. So one way to deal with this is to somehow normalize the objective to have identical eccentricity in all directions. Then all of them will have identical opti optimal step sizes, and you can, it's easier to find a working leaning, uh, learning rate. So basically, so if I think of this as a function of w1 and w2, I want to scale w1 and w2 in different, uh, using two different scaling factors, s1 and s2, such that when both of these are scaled, the resulting contour plot is perfectly uh, symmetric and circular. So in this case now, I can find the, the location of the optimum on this figure. And on this figure, I know that the step sizes in the different directions, the optimal step sizes in the different directions are all the same. And then having found that, then I can go back and undo the scaling and find the true location. So for this sort of guy, you can find that for, for when you have uh, uh, perfectly circular contour plots, then the corresponding quadratic is going to have is going to have an equation of this form, where you have no matrix A in between. It's just a perfect quadratic. This can be expressed as the sum of several uh, circular quadratics. So you want to somehow transform the Ws into W hat by scaling the individual Ws, such that the resulting error function expressed in terms of W hat has this form. So here's what you can do. Here's the original equation. Here's what you want to convert it to. And you want to scale each of the directions. So you want to scale W by multiplying it by some matrix S to get W hat such that the error, resulting error has this form. Simple inspection will tell you, just comparing this guy to this guy, will tell you that S has to be the square root of A. And once you do that, then here's what you're going to get. The modified update rule, so here was the original objective function. I modified my, uh, I scaled my coefficients, my, 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 my directions, and now I have the modified objective function. The gradient descent rule for the modified objective function is simply going to be this guy, where this is the gradient computed on this surface. 
and this eta is the optimal step size for this surface. If you expand it out, that actually goes back and in this domain that gives you this new update rule which is to say wk plus 1 equals wk minus not just the gradient at the current location but a inverse times the gradient at the current location. So just this simple modification gets rid of the fact that the optimal step sizes are different in different directions. And now if this is a quadratic, you can expect to get to the optimal global, global uh, optimum in a single step using this estimate. More generally, your functions are not going to be quadratic. Your functions are going to be, you know, if you, hopefully they are convex, you can try to come up with a quadratic Taylor series approximation, which is the bowl that sits within the function, in which case the, uh, the multiplicative term for the, for the quadratic term is the Hessian. So what, would, what this would mean is that you have an, ob uh, 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 an objective function of this kind, which is not a quadratic, but if your current estimate is over here, you're going to use a Taylor series up, up, up expansion around this point and approximate the, this function by this guy and find the optimal solution, which is this one, and find the optimal solution for this one. And this guy has a nice quadratic form. And because he has a quadratic form, you can get to the solution in a single step. And so what you would do is uh, get to the, try to get to the solution of this approximation in a single step using the corresponding update rule. So what you find that the uh, update rule over here for this guy is wk plus 1 equals wk minus uh, eta times the eta can actually be 1 in this case for a quadratic function the inverse of the Hessian of the function computed at this point times the gradient of the function computed at this point. Now the Hessian, because the inverse Hessian, because the Hessian ends up becoming the multiplicative term for the quadratic approximation of the function. So eta has got to be one if you want to get, this, get to the solution in a single step for this one. In any case, eta should not be greater than two. So here's how this, when eta is one, this actually ends up giving you Newton's method. And so here's how Newton's method actually works. Uh, you uh, first start off at some location and then you compute a quadratic approximation to the function at that location. And in a single step, you go to the optimal estimate for that quadratic approximation. Then from that step, you compute a new quadratic approximation using Taylor series and get to the optimum for that new approximation in a single step. In each case, the update rule is going to be this. And you will keep doing this till you get to the optimum. So the problem here, so this is a very nice algorithm and it's actually going to converge very fast. The problem here is that this Hessian, this Hessian is going to be a matrix. If you have, if the variables W have D terms, then the Hessian matrix is going to be D cross D. In a neural network, the number of variables is the number of weights can be in thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions. So which means that your Hessian matrix is going to be a million cross million. It's simply not going to be possible to compute this Hessian for the full matrix. And it's going to be even harder to invert because you need to invert the Hessian matrix over here uh, in order to get the estimate. There's also this other thing. All that works very nicely for convex functions. If the function is not convex, the Hessian may not even be positive semi-definite, semi in which case the algorithm can diverge. So here, for example, is a function that has a unique global minimum. But if I compute a quadratic approximation at this loca location, that quadratic approximation is actually a bowl pointing in the wrong direction. And so now, if I use Newton's method to get to the opt to get to find the solution for this quadratic approximation computed at this point, that's actually going to end up going away from the minimum rather than the minimum. So now in order to avoid this, when you actually begin computing these quadratic approximations, you have to include additional tests to make sure that your estimates are actually going towards the minimum and not away from it. So all of this means that this Newton's method based approaches can't really be directly used for optimizing complicated uh, functions like the divergences for neural networks. 
Now, there are a great many uh, alternative approaches that have been proposed which approximate the Hessian in a number of ways, like the BFGS, uh, BFGS or the low memory BFGS, which compute estimates from, estimate Hessians from finite differences. You have the Levenberg Marquardt, which estimates Hessians from Jacobians, and then additionally diagonal, diagonal loaded to ensure it's positive definite. Then you have other quasi-Newton methods. Uh, and uh, some methods, even instead of looking at the Hessian for the entire set of variables, you could look at some subsets of variables. But all of these end up being unnecessarily complex, and they're not particularly popular anymore for large neural networks. Now, these complications arise because we are trying to ensure that our optimization, our iterative estimates don't blow up but they somehow sort of converge towards the optimum. So all of this was based on trying to ensure that the step size was not so large as to cause divergence within a convex region. So here you have a convex region. Even within this convex region, if my step size is too large, the estimate can diverge, and you're trying to prevent this. But then, is this really important? Think of a loss function of this kind, which has many local minima. So for a loss function of this kind, if I'm over here, I don't necessarily want to find this guy estimate. I would like to find this one, or better still, I'd like to come here. So here, having a step size which is more than twice the optimal step size for this local optimum can actually be, be a good thing. But if you always have a step size that's more than twice the local optimum, what this means is that you're never going to actually find the optimum. So what you really want is a learning rate that initially is large enough that you're actually diverging within any local regions, but then the learning rate keeps decreasing. So when that happens, your learning rate is going to make you, make you bounce off this, off this local minimum. And then when you get to a large enough bowl, eventually it's going to, your learning rate is going to become small enough that you'll find the minimum of that large enough bowl. So you want to start with a large learning rate typically greater than two, assuming Hessian normalization, and then gradually reduce the learning rate with iterations. So here is a typical decay sequence for the decaying learning rate. You start off with some learning rate, and at each step, in the kth step, the new learning rate is going to be your initial learning rate divided by k plus one. Or you can have a quadratic decay, where the scaling factor is a quadratically related to the step index, or exponential decay. Uh, now, a common approach for neural networks in particular is to start off with some fixed learning rate and keep learning with it till the loss stagnates. And then when the loss stagnates, that, uh, uh, that typically means that maybe you come to a bowl of this kind and you're bouncing around in one location, then you step, decrease the learning rate by some uh, small factor alpha and then continue, continue the process till the loss stagnates and then you decrease the learning rate again. So the story so far, gradient descent can miss obvious answers, but sometimes this may be a good thing. Convergence issues abound. So the error surface has many saddle points, although perhaps not so many bad local minima, and gradient descent can stagnate on star saddle points. Vanilla gradient descent may not converge or may converge too slowly because the optimal learning rate for one component may be too high or too low for the other components. Now, second order methods try to normalize the variation along the components to mitigate the problem of different optimal learning rates for different components, but this requires computation of inverses of second order derivatives, and this is computationally infeasible, and it's not stable in non-convex regions of the error surface. So you have approximate methods that address these issues, but we may need simpler solutions. So, Continuing with the story so far, uh, the divergence causing learning rates may not really be a bad thing. We saw that, particularly when the loss functions are ugly. So what you really want to have is decaying learning rates, which provide a good compromise between escaping poor local minima and convergence. And many of these convergence issues arise because we are forcing the same learning rate on all parameters. So if you take a step back, what we have is when I'm trying to when I have a vector w and I'm trying to update it, I'm going to start, the way I do it is wk plus one equals wk, 
minus eta times the gradient of the error with respect to the w, this gradient is a vector, which means that for every single component of w, you're using the same step size. And all of the problems we have arise because this step size is the same for all components of w. You've tied the step size across all components because they're all tied to the gradient. So you can try to release this requirement and use algorithms that derivative, use deri uh, derivative information for trends but do not follow them absolutely. And two such algorithms are rprop and quickprop. Uh, rprop is so-called resilient propagation. It's a simple algorithm that has to be followed independently for each component. That is to say the steps in the different sizes are not coupled at each time, if the derivative of the current location recommends continuing in the same direction as before, then you increase the step size. So let's say I can go both in this direction and in this direction. So when I take a step, I will consider both of these directions independently. And in this direction, I've taken a step and I found that the loss has decreased, the error has decreased. That means I must continue increasing walking in this direction, except now I'll take a longer step. Now, on the other hand, in the other direction, I've taken a step and, the, and I find that the error increased, then I want to go back and take a smaller step. And I'm going to do this independently for each of the directions. And this actually works very nicely. So here's what we do. We'd select, this is going to be done independently for every direction. You'd select an initial W, you compute the derivative, and if you find that walking against the derivative has reduced the error, then you continue, you compute the derivative in the, in the new location. If the derivative has not changed sign, it means your, that if you continue in the same direction, the error is going to continue decreasing. So now you take a longer step. So the step size is multiplied by some factor alpha, where alpha is greater than one. And if after going there, you find that the error is still decreasing, which is to say the sign of the derivative has not changed, then you take an even longer step. So now you're going to be alpha squared times the initial step size. And you keep doing this until you are eventually arrive at a point where you overshot the minimum. And you will know that you've overshot the minimum if the sign of the derivative has changed. At which point you go back to where you took this large step from and now take a somewhat smaller step. And you can repeat this process. It's a very simple algorithm. And this would be done independently for every single component. This is rprop. So here is the pseudocode for rprop. I'll uh, uh, leave the, leave the uh, I'll let you go through the slides yourselves. The idea must be simple enough. So rprop is this remarkably simple first order algorithm that's frequently much more efficient than simple gradient descent and can be competitive against even some of the most uh, advanced second order methods that we have today. It makes only minimal assumptions about the loss function, doesn't make any assumptions about convexity. Then you have other equivalents like quick prop. Quick prop actually uses Newton updates, but with the two modifications. First one, this is the standard Newton update. It's the current estimate minus a step against the gradient, but scaled by the inverse of the Hessian. And so the two modifications is first, it deals with each indi dimension independently. So which is to say, instead of taking a derivative, instead of taking the inverse Hessian, you're just taking the inverse of the partial derivative with respect to that component, which means it eliminates the need to compute and invert expensive Hessians. The second one is that it doesn't actually compute the derivative, it approximates the second derivative through finite differences. What was the derivative of the, at, the, at the previous step minus what is the derivative of the, at the current step? That difference gives me an estimate of the second derivative. So here is the update to update rule for quick prop. This too, I, will, I, will not, I won't actually go through it. Uh, this guy is the uh, finite difference approximation for the second derivative. And so this is just looks like Newton's rule. It's done independently for each component. And this too is a very effective and efficient algorithm. So quick prop has some instability for non-convex objective functions, but it's still one of the fastest training algorithm for many problems. So uh, coming to the close of today's lecture, we've seen gradient descent can miss obvious answers. Vanilla gradient descent may be too slow or unstable because the different dimensions behave differently.
Second order methods normalize the variation across dimensions but are complex. Adaptive or decaying learning rates can improve convergence and methods that de decouple the dimensions can improve convergence. Uh, so I'll stop right here. In the next class, we will look at other methods, including uh, momentum-based methods and, uh, and uh, online update rules. Thank you.